Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. In my mind, successful fintech company is usually start with a strong technology infrastructure. So a lot of what we do in both in many layers is to enable really world-class technology, both on the ability to integrate to external systems from the accounting side to other side and to orchestrate all the processes that enable us to create really frictionless experiences for our clients. That was Oded Zabi, the CEO and co-founder of Mesh Payments, and he is our special guest this week. This is episode 106 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Oded grew up in a small town outside of Tel Aviv, Israel. He spent time at both PayPal and Payoneer before starting Mesh Payments. Mesh Payments helps SMBs and mid-market companies in the U.S. to manage and control their expenses. Their clients can fully automate their corporate payments without exposing themselves to the risks that exist today. Mesh Payments has been in business for three years and has 30 employees. They have grown 600% over the last eight months. Oded and I talk about what differentiates Mesh Payments as well as the future of B2B payments. He has a passion for football and for helping startup companies scale and understand their payments infrastructure. We've got a great episode today, so let's get started. Hi, Oded. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Hi, Greg. Happy to be here. So let's dive right in. Maybe tell the audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. So I grew up in a small suburb of Tel Aviv, and I spent most of my childhood there. As you know, we are all at the age of 18, are mandated to go to the army, which that's what Israeli do. and I was fortunate that I was one of the few that was uh, invited be- instead of going to the army to go to the uh, university. And I finished computer science in three years, which meant that I was uh, planned to become a technology leader in the Israeli army. And in opposite to most of the other or all of the other guys in my age, I decided it's too early for me to be a geek. And I decided to ask to join a, an operational team in the Israeli army and to spend a few years leading real soldiers and be part of operational activities, which, by the way, that's my first advice to many young people that are starting their career. There is enough time to do technology, but there are so many things, uh, so many soft skills that you can learn being part of uh, amazing experiences like that. So that was really the first major thing that influenced my early career. Okay. And where do you currently live? So I live in Erzeliya, which is like the Silicon Valley of Israel. A lot of technology companies all around, uh, many iconic companies out of Erzeliya and an amazing beach. Not as nice as Miami, but we are getting there. (laughs) Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about Mesh Payments. So tell us what Mesh Payments does. So Mesh payment helps SMBs and mid-market companies to work to manage and control their SaaS services and corporate expenses. We are operating for almost three years. We are 30 employees. Many of us are veterans of the payment space coming from iconic companies like PayPal and Payoneer. We have been servicing a growing number of companies and helping them solve big pains that have been amplified by COVID-19, which are they need to pay for services, which many of them have moved to the cloud and many of them have moved to the recurring business model. And now all of that is linked to a corporate card, which most of finance people will prefer to, if they could, to eliminate corporate cards, which are perceived as payment instruments without control and without visibilities. So we provide them a system that is orchestrating the entire processes from the minute the employee needs to pay for a specific service or a specific expense up to the approval flow by the finance team. We will generate the payment instrument, which will be mostly a virtual card. And a lot of our technology is leveraging 
virtual cards that have been here for so long, but now with the combination of software and processes enables companies to pay and enables the employees to pay in a secure way, in a highly controlled way and with full visibility. Add to that the fact that we are orchestrating the entire collection of the receipt and up to the synchronization, which is fully automatic with the accounting system that enables our clients to fully automate their corporate payments without exposing the company to all the bad things that a generic corporate card program might bring. And this is an exciting time for us and, and for the entire space. So many finance teams that historically were not considering changing the way they are operating for so many years have been pushed, especially because now the companies are remote and employees are spread around the US or around the world. And because most of the payments are online, that's really enabled us to grow. We grew uh, 600% in the last eight months, which is an amazing growth and, and really brings a lot of challenges to an early stage startup like Mesh. Sure. So is your business model a monthly sort of SaaS fee or how does, how, what is your revenue model? So we our biggest challenge is not only to acquire customers. The market opportunity for us is huge. So almost any company in the world needs something like Mesh. And most of them don't have anything beyond maybe a very simple Amex or their own bank corporate card. So the opportunity for us to acquire new customers is in almost infinite. But for me, it's even more important than the acquisition of these customers is to help them migrate all their existing payments to our platform. And to do that, we are creating a very simple incentive model, which is not only you don't need to pay us anything, we will pay you in the end of the month a cashback, which is the way we just share the revenue we generate, mainly from the interchange with our clients. So it's a very simple and straightforward model, but really create a clear incentive to all these companies to start quickly, don't hesitate, and more important, move as many payments that they have. Some of them currently on their existing corporate cards, currently have been managed through wires or ACHs to our platform. Okay. And you mentioned something interesting about virtual cards and how they've been around for a long time. What do you think has really driven the use of those? Is it really COVID that has made that such a big, you know, a big trend in this space? In my mind, the, the conversation about virtual cards is mostly for the payment ecosystem. Customers, they don't really care about virtual cards or any other payment instruments. They need a better way to pay, more control, more visibility. And coincidentally or not coincidentally, virtual cards that have you mentioned correctly have been here for a long time are one of the simplest options with a lot of control and with the right infrastructure that enable a sophisticated platform to enable these clients to pay. So just as an example, one of the nicest things we are doing for our clients, we are isolating every payment for each vendor on a separate virtual card, which means that when an employee needs to pay for LinkedIn, as an example, instead of providing him a, a corporate card number that he might abuse, the system will automatically generate a virtual card, a v, in our case, uh, for now, a Visa card that will be locked inside LinkedIn. So the finance team that will deliver that payment instrument to him won't have fears that that employee can use that card anywhere else. And from the other end, the employee will be able to get in real time a payment instrument that will be accepted by LinkedIn. That's the real combination and the real value in, in what we offer to our clients. Okay. And you mentioned you sell into small businesses, mid-market size companies. Are there certain verticals within those that you focus on? Or is it basically any, any company that pays bills as a potential target? So any company that pays bills is, is a potential client. Of course, as usual, the tech industry was the early adopters of what we do. And we have many iconic technology companies like Monday.com and others that many of them, by the way, went public lately, which there is a huge boom in the technology sector. But we provide services to so many other clients that we may, might be the only technology that the finance team is using. So a lot of media companies that need to spend, we even fuel accounting teams that are helping 
senators to build campaigns. We have so many amazing use cases. I'm learning new use cases almost every week. And the, the lowest common denominator is that all of them, they are looking for something that is very simple, but from the other end, provide them a lot of sophistication. And I think that's one of the key things in what we've built. To enable the clients, they don't need to think about the payment itself. They need to think about what they are paying for, who needs to pay, what is the approval process for that, and the payment will be embedded into these experiences. Okay. And I assume you're based in Israel, but are you selling globally? So I personally, uh, currently in Tel Aviv, but I'm spending a lot of my time in the U.S. Most of our business team is in the U.S. We are currently selling only in the U.S. market. As you probably know, when it comes to payment services, there is a lot of emphasis about compliance and risk. And we've built a very extensive infrastructure that enables us to service U.S. companies. For now, we have the market opportunity in the U.S. is so huge. So we are not even thinking about going global, even though from time to time, companies that have the same pains outside of the U.S. are asking us, when are you coming to our territory? So I'm spending part of my time in the U.S., part of my time in Tel Aviv, where our amazing technology team and pro- technology and product team are. And this is really exciting. There is so many fintech, amazing fintech companies that have started in Tel Aviv and now are uh, the market leaders, companies like Pioneer, Tipalti, Funbox, Bluevine. And I think it's an amazing time for the Israeli fintech ecosystem. Yeah, just the word fintech has grown so much and just the amount of money being invested in payments and fintech spaces is, is just amazing. One final question about, the, or maybe a couple more questions about the company. How do you go to market? Do you sell through a direct sales force, through partnership channels? How do you go to market? So, of course, like any startup that wishes to go live and go forward, we started with the direct model. We have a small but an experienced sales team that through our network and through the usual marketing tactics have uh, succeeded to acquire many, many high-profile brands that brought a lot of their, that referred us to other companies. And we are still a lot of our focus on the uh, direct to businesses option. Of course, as we grow, one of the latest things we are building is a network of partnerships. Uh, One of the examples is that we are going to announce a strategic partnership with a, with a leading global payroll company. And I'm a huge believer in the convergence between payroll and non-payroll spend as an example. So, and I will, I'm going to, we are going to see the consolidation and this conversion, I think, across the industry. So, for example, we are expecting to be offered to order this payroll company customers. And we have many other partnership opportunities that will grow over time. The combination of becoming a world-leading brand and selecting the right partners that will amplify our business, that's how I see the next few years for Mesh. Okay. And, you know, you mentioned it, the sheer amount of opportunity in this space. I mean, the the B2B payment space is is just huge within the U.S. And then when you start thinking globally, I mean, it's just amazing. And there's a lot of companies, you know, in this space now. So what would you say differentiates Mesh from the competitors out there? So you're right. Our Again, our space is really hot. A lot of uh, investment are coming into many of the uh, incumbent and, and new players in our space. In my mind, a successful fintech company is usually start with a strong technology infrastructure. So a lot of what we do in both in many layers is to enable really world-class technology, both on the ability to integrate to external systems from the accounting side to other side and to orchestrate all the processes that enable us to create really frictionless experiences for our clients. And the strong uh, technology infrastructure, that's really what show our clients how we can operate. Add to that on the flip side, like any other fintech and especially in payment, and this is something I've seen many times when talking with clients and when they evaluate other solutions, you need to have a very strong payment infrastructure and a payment stack in order to, that is fully compliance and secure, especially when you go to high profile clients, uh, public companies and companies that need to scale. So a lot of what we build is about having a very scalable payment infrastructure with all the compliance and risk components associated with that. This is something 
that a company in our space that only focus on the technology will have hard time to build. And last but not least, we believe that the future of the corporate spend is not really about corporate spend. It's about embedding what we do and creating a context to any payment that the corporate needs to have. So it's not really about who pays like today. Today, the company usually focus on who pays and should we give him a corporate card or not. It's more about what do you pay for? And in our mind, there is a difference in a transaction that goes to a SaaS a service than for a transaction that goes to a maybe travel agency. And we are adding multiple layers of data that will enable the finance team to make better decisions about should they approve or should they enable that transaction. This is what I believe is the future of corporate spend. And this is really the innovation we are building on our platform. Okay. And you've kind of answered it at a high level, but beyond just the what you see as the future of corporate spend, what other trends do you see? Where is sort of the payments industry headed, say, in the next two to three years? So in my mind, if we will look two years ahead, I think there will be less and less conversation about the payment aspects of corporate spend. If you look at, by the way, the consumer payments, most of the consumers today, they are indifferent about the payment instrument itself. They are looking for better experiences, how that payment is embedded in the way they operate. I think these trends are going to reach, they're already starting to reach the business-to-business payment space. So a lot of what we do and and many of the players in in our space is really to embed the payment itself into processes and flows that are on the business day-to-day activities. And I think in two to three years, more and more discussion or more and more systems will enable the corporates to spend without even discussing how they are going to spend. The next big thing in my mind, and that's I'm looking a little bit much into the future, today the way that finance team behaves, it's really about they need to approve everything because control is so important on the business space. Today, almost 100% of the transactions are being reviewed before they are being approved, before they are being reconciled, before the finance team can close the month. If I look ahead to five to 10 years from now, I see a reverse trend where finance team will only need to manage exceptions. So the technology will handle a lot of the reconciliation, a lot of the automatic approval processes, a lot of the things that today are require manual intervention. And the finance team will only need to handle a very small percentage of exceptions, hopefully close to a zero, which is going to really change the way finance teams operate and provide them time to do other things, do more planning, create more value to their clients and less and less focus on manual reconciliation and audit processes, which is today maybe what they do most of the day. So do you think that's more five to 10 years out? In finance, usually everything is taking longer than expected, and especially on the corporate side, things are slower than we wish. A lot of companies still use very old expense management systems, the technology is so outdated, takes them a lot of time even to think about what it means for them to change the processes that they have been using for so many years. So even though I think the technology is already mature and the mindset of the finance teams are already ready to for disruption, it usually takes more than we expect. And that's why We are happy that we are in an early stage. We are growing fast, but still we have so much ahead of us. And we believe that that will be more or less tuned with the way that the industry is growing. Yeah, what's interesting is, you know, when Square came along, their whole value prop was make it fast, easy and simple. And Uber comes along and they make the transaction frictionless. Those were all more small business consumer oriented value props. But now I'm hearing those same words being said by people who are serving the B2B space right? They want it to be fast and easy and simple and they want to take the friction out of it. So it's kind of interesting how, you know, the last 10 years we've heard those terms and now we're starting to hear them in B2B. So I really think you're, you know, spot on on your trend of the future. 
more and more people are talking about the consumerization of, of business payments. I think it's beyond that. It's not just taking consumer-oriented experience and putting them into the business space. I think we will create new types of experiences that are really linked to the specific needs, which are so different between the business space or the corporate space to the consumer's day-to-day needs. And that's really what excites us in the space. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So tell us about your journey, how you got to be the CEO and co-founder there, sort of your professional background. So I was fortunate to be selected to start and manage PayPal's business in Middle East Africa. That was 2009. PayPal was relatively then a much smaller company than it is today. I was lucky to be one of the people at PayPal that really wrote the playbook, How You Go International. I've launched some exotic countries and to launch a country requires a lot of understanding from the compliance side to the, the technology side and many things that are multidisciplinary. And that was really amazing days. And a lot of the PayPal executives that have been there are now leading the global payment space. So this is, was really a, an event in a historical nature. After PayPal, I chose to lead the business for what was then a relatively a small payment company and now is considered the most successful fintech company that came out of Tel Aviv called Pioneer which uh, just went public, I think, a few weeks ago. Pioneer is really unique in a way that it was maybe the first truly global payment company servicing freelancers in almost any country from the U.S. to Bhutan, providing them the ability to get paid even before people were talking about the gig economy and all the things that are now considered mainstream. And these were really amazing time for me. Pioneer grew a lot and now is one of the biggest payment companies in the world. And the combination of PayPal, Pioneer, beyond the fact that most of my team have followed me from these companies, have really helped me to understand how global payment works, to get experience in so many different payment challenges. And that was the basics to the reason to found Mesh almost three years ago. As I mentioned, we were so happy that we had the opportunity to found Mesh with a small team of payment veterans. We are spending the last three years building our product, bringing more and more clients, creating a lot of innovation to be a startup today. The fact that you can get so much funding and grow faster than ever This is one of the most amazing things, especially in a space that is that the opportunities are almost infinite. And myself and the amazing team we have built, that's the reason why I'm enjoying every day of building Mesh. Okay. Did you raise money to start the company? We raised uh, $3 million when we started on a deck that doesn't have any linkage to what we do today. That's, I think, one of the interesting things in our space. Uh, More and more investors understand that it's first of all uh, about the team and about the experience and the attitude, even before the specific idea. We pivoted very close to when COVID started to what we do today. And we were lucky because a lot of the technology and infrastructure we built even before was flexible enough and mature enough to enable us a very quick and successful pivot. But we've raised some more money end of last year and we'll probably raise some more Soon, the fact that today, if you are a successful fintech company with a strong brand and many happy customers, that's really what help enables you to raise money and, and to grow the team and the business without spending too much time of it. And that's one of the advantages of these days. Yes, it is. It definitely is. So what is one thing that you are passionate about professionally and one thing you're passionate about personally? So personally, I'm a, I'm a huge football fan. I'm, I was uh, lucky that one of my activities when I launched South Africa for PayPal was to get PayPal up and running before the World Cup in South Africa. And of course, as an executive, I decided I need to spend that time in South Africa and make sure everything works well while I'm be able to watch some of these amazing games. And from that point on, I continued 
going to more of these football events with my family and friends. So I'm very passionate. I even came back from the Euro a few weeks ago when I attended a few games, even though it's much tougher than it was before. And for me, that's really uh, one of the things that really makes me happy. Of course, I'm spending most of my time helping companies and not only fintech company to understand payments. I'm so happy that payments have become a very key success factor to many companies, not only from the fintech space. And as somebody that has spent so much time in both in so many aspects of payments, I usually try to help companies to scale their payment infrastructure, to make sure they understand what they need to do. So to work with so many exciting startups is one of the things that I'm most passionate about. Okay. You know, I asked this question and I I feel like every CEO that I talk to obviously brings their own unique perspective to it. And, you know, we've talked about fintech a lot and there's a lot of people wanting to get into the fintech space, obviously. I mean, it's growing and all the investment. And so a lot of young people coming into the industry what advice would you give them to help them be successful? Say someone coming out of college that wants to get into fintech, what would you tell them they need to do to be successful? So for me, payments is, is a language and it's a combination of technology, experience, risk and compliance. And you need to understand all of them if you want to be successful. And you need to be very experienced and understand the bits and the bytes. Every mesh employee maybe in his first week, is getting a lecture by me about the fundamentals of global payments. And that's something we are still sticking with, even though the company has grown, but still we really make sure that every new employee understands the fundamentals and the bits and the bytes of the payment landscape, because that's one of the key success factors for him and the way for him to understand the language we are all talking in the company. And Payment is amazing. You know, people don't understand the complexity, the underlying complexity of enabling somebody to traveling from one country to the other to swipe a a plastic card in a point of sale in any merchant and get uh, settled, then get out of that store with the goods while all the settlement of the funds is happening in the background. It sounds very simple, but there is so much complexity And in order to be successful and to understand what usually what I advise to entrepreneur and I'm getting like almost every week somebody with a great idea that either doesn't have the compliance infrastructure to enable it, which is most of the cases, or it's an amazing idea, but the technology will not support it. So in order to create a really amazing fintech or payment service, you need to understand all the layers and understand the complexity. And I've seen so many companies that have done that and really scaled. And the era is waiting for disruption. Everywhere you touch, there are opportunities to disrupt the payment and the banking industry. But to do that, you need to understand well where you are heading and really before you do anything, make sure you are knowledgeable in in what's needed. Remember the last main difference between creating a payment company and, and most of the other opportunities is that in any other startup, if you make mistake, at most you will get bankrupt. In a payment company, if you will make mistakes, you might go to jail. And that's an important differentiation. And I advise entrepreneurs, wherever they are, under, to understand well the payment space before they run. Absolutely. I think that's some great advice. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about you. We've talked about the company. We've talked about the industry. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? I really call to all finance people and I'm trying to, I spend at least every week or even a few times a week speaking with finance executives, even not our clients, to understand their pains, but more importantly, to encourage them to rethink the way they are operating. I think that the time has come for finance team to get more technology. It's not as painful as it was. People, when they think about financial technology, they think about implementing a new accounting system or a new ERP, which usually takes a lot of time and requires a lot of resources. To bring new system, new technologies like we provide can take a few hours or a few days, and it really changes the way that these finance teams operate. And I really call 
finance people to understand, in my mind, the biggest challenge of our industry or complacency and inertia. If we will be able to reduce that, to minimize that, the future of what we are doing is almost infinite. Yeah. Well, Oded, I thank you so much for being on the show. And I know your time is very valuable. So I want you to, to get back to your busy schedule. So I really appreciate you being here today. Thanks, Reg. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 